You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. With predators, what they'll do is, and this, this has a flip side because you'll have a predator that likes boys 7 to 10. When that boy reaches 10 and their development and they're moving on, then predators will li literally, what they'll do is they'll hold on to that 10-year-old because they've worked hard to break down the barriers of that child. And then what they'll do is they'll use him to facilitate younger boys to come in. And, and there were certain predators that I were with that just wanted to get so close that they could potentially sort of like smell that, that child. Do you know what I mean? Because that's what really excited them. Um, you save one child, then it becomes an obsession. You want to save more. Do you know what I mean? You feel as though, well, hold on a minute. I've been in, in the most horrendous situation. I know I can do this. Do you know what I mean? And that's what keeps you going. I befriended somebody and we eventually uh, moved into a particular network. And when we moved into this network, on the day that I met these people for the very first time, and there were six of them, they brought a 12-year-old boy into the flat and they wanted me to have sex with that boy. That's where the pressure is like, it's through the roof, James. It's through the roof because I've got six predators there who are absolutely, they've gone, do you know what I mean? They're, they're sexually sort of so perverse and active. We'd spent six hours looking at all these sort of child images. The computer's a wash of, of um, material. I've got evidence all over the all over the floor and all this sort of stuff. Um, and yet at the end of the day, I've got to hold this, this boy and I've got to protect this boy. I can't take back. Sadly, I can't take back what, what's happened to the boy previously. Do you know what I mean? It's the here and the now. I've got to... All I know is that whilst I'm here, no one's going to touch him and that he's safe. I don't, I don't think you're going to stop it. And I, I don't think it's, it's something that, you know, you're going to say, do you know what? We're going to wipe this all out and, and it's never going to happen again. It's a bad dream. Uh, but it isn't. It's going to be there and it will be there for life forever. Boom, we're on. Right. Today's guest, we've got Ian James. How are you, Ian? Nice to meet you. Nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. Yeah. I've done over 200 podcasts, Ian, and um, this one is probably one of the darkest. Like, you were uh, released a book called Save a Child. You were an undercover paedophile where you worked undercover to catch paedophiles. You had to become one to catch them. You've helped potentially save 100 kids' lives. Like, you put so many different people in prison. Yes, it's a dark job to many, but if it wasn't for you, you wouldn't be able to help save those innocent kids. But first and foremost, how are you? I'm fine. I'm okay. Um, obviously, that that time has gone. Do you know what I mean? So I'm I'm doing other stuff now. But uh, but yeah, it was it, it's um, it's a it's a very you're right. It's a very dark subject. Um, but but hopefully we can still learn from from things that have gone on in the past. Uh, and I and I do think that at the end of the day, it's all about sort of education and awareness. So parents being unaware of of uh, of that, there are people out there, sadly, who want to abuse their children. Yeah, that's a sad thing. And I think back in the day, maybe 10, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I think a lot of this stuff was kind of swept under the carpet. But now a lot of people are coming forward and um, it seems to be rife just now that how much frequently this actually goes on, that people might be oblivious to it because it's never really happened to them or their kids. But as you know, you were at the forefront and you know how dangerous it is out there. Yeah, I think I think uh, 20 years ago, it was a subject that no one really wanted to talk about. And if it didn't affect your child, then it, it, it didn't, you know what I mean? It, you just like, left it alone. I think as time's gone on, and I think certain high-profile cases have, have really helped potentially victims coming forward and speaking, and agencies and organisations working together to save children, do you know what I mean? So I, I do think that socially now, people are a little bit more aware, but still there's that complacency of, well, it's not going to happen to us. Um, so I think, yeah, 20 years ago, no one would talk about it. And it would be very difficult. And I think the legislation showed it because the legislation wasn't there to properly deal with the problem. Um, whereas sort of 2003 onwards, you've got the Sexual Offences Act, which covers a wide range of offences um, and goes a long way to trying to catch these people. Yeah. Always go back to the start of my guest, Ian. 
where you grew up, how it all began. Okay, so um, uh, I was born in Cornwall uh, in a, in a, and lived in a little village outside Penzance, so you can't get further southwest. It's right down, I think it's about 16 miles from Land's End, so you're right down the bottom. Uh, went to primary school um, and secondary modern school, and then sort of Cornwall's uh, at that time in the 60s and 70s, it, it was a place where tin mining was still going, you had your tourism. Um, so for for opportunities to do to do work outside of that, as, as well as fishing the fishing industry, um, I, I decided to move away and join the police. Um, and it's a big step because you you're sort of like very much in your sort of environment of the West Country in Cornwall, and you're like in this bubble. Um, and then suddenly I go to London, and it's like the big wide world. Um, so yeah, so I, I went there as a as a cadet. Uh, because of my age of 18, I sort of um, I went on a short uh, short cadetship and then joined the police. And then literally, that's it. I just stayed in the police, uh, in the Met, uh, for about uh, sort of just over 10 years, boarding on, you know, like 12 years. And then from there, I then moved up to uh, to Cleveland Police. What was it like going into the police for the first time? Uh, yeah, interesting. Um I mean, because from a discipline point of view, you know, like um, even uh, I always go back to, to something that happened to me when I when I joined the police and you go to the barbers and you get your hair cut and like, but it's not a normal barbers. It's a barbers that just just cut police officers or new recruits hair. And it was a case of sitting in the in the in the chair. And I just went, can I have a bit off here and a bit off there? And it just went and it was just short. And it was a, that was a shock because like, I never really had short hair before. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, it's, um, when I joined in, in, in the late seventies, so it was 1978 when I joined, um, th there was still a lot of like importance of like, um, you know, you're joining the police, so you must know the difference between right and wrong. Um, you, you, you know, you're going to be tested at, at various times. Uh, it was a multicultural, uh, sort of environment. Uh, and when I went to Stoke Newington, um, it was basically 95% black Afro-Caribbean uh, and the rest was a mixture of sort of the Asian community, the Irish. Um, and it's a massive culture shock. What kind of crimes were you doing? What kind of criminals were you catching back then? Uh, it was your street robbers, your uh, pickpockets, um, your burglars. Uh, and then as I escalated within the, the sort of like the, the CID world, um, you know, we were dealing with, with rapes and uh, sexual assaults, um, robberies and stuff like that, yeah. How hard is it to see all that kind of going through your first few years? Does that affect you straight away or do you kind of get used to it? I think you get used to it. It's like when you see your first dead body, um, you know, it's a bit of a shock. Um, but then, you know, sadly at Stoke Newington, there was quite a lot of murders over a period of time. So you were regularly seeing, seeing dead bodies. Um, and you sort of like, you sort of like come accustomed to it. You're sort of like, yeah. You sort of like switch off, even though you have your empathy, but you you, you tend to switch off because that's how you have to deal with that sort of like grief. You become cold then towards the world. Uh, your personality changes a little bit, I think, um, because again you're you're trying to like um, sort of be a professional and deal with what you've got to deal with. Um, sadly, the, the person dies. You know, you, you yes, you you, you know, it's, it, sometimes it can be quite horrific because it could be a fire. Or, or, or it could be a, a stabbing, but they're both like quite severe. Was that much counselling and stuff back in the seventies and eighties for police officers? I don't think it was as, as no, bad no. As, if I'm being yeah. honest, uh, no, I don't think there was. Um, there wasn't any any sort of like counselling or support as such. I think it was a case of um, deal with that. You you had to deal with it. Mm -hmm. You would talk to your colleagues. Uh, and you would chat about probably your experiences that you've had, um, and that was that was a way of like overcoming potential uh some issues um i think as time went on then there was a, a a total mindset of like um do you know what professional people can be affected by yeah. by, by grief did you were you going down see once you started moving through the ranks because you're very well respected in a police force see when you started moving down the ranks did you have a certain path you wanted to choose or did everything just kind of fall into your place uh, i i didn't if i'm being honest i didn't like traffic and I wasn't really involved. I didn't like being involved in traffic offences and stuff like that. So I, I was very much keen on, on the CID world, the criminal 
the criminal world. Do you know what I mean? I like the rob, you know, being involved and trying to, you know, like track down robbers and people that rob on the street and, and burglars and stuff like that. That was the the crime is what I I liked. I, I sort of enjoyed that sort of environment really. Is it? Did, were you undercover before you went into? Uh, the undercover people no uh, no I didn't I, I sort of my undercover world started um, sort of like in 1990 uh, that, that's when it sort of really started to take shape and take off um, and that was because I went into a particular department when I moved up north to Cleveland um, and I joined a squad and, and from there that's how I developed my my sort of under, undercover skills there yeah but I was quite fortunate that I would say I was very fortunate to work in the West End of London. So I policed Soho, um, Oxford Street, Regent Street. But Soho in particular, you know, that, that's a real eye-opener, uh, you know, from a sexual point of view and for all the things that were going on in the 70s and the 80s. Yeah, a lot of drugs, prostitution. A lot of prostitution. Uh, you've got your homosexual sort of light environment. Uh, where you had your, they were known as rent boys at, at the time. They They had all sorts of vulnerabilities. Do you know what I mean? But... They weren't viewed as, as vulnerable, sadly, at that time. Um, so, so that environment sort of paid, sort of stood me in good stead for later when I went into this this dark world, um, because that definitely sort of helped me to deal with certain issues, especially in the in this sort of overt homosexual scene where it can be quite like full on. Yeah. What about informants? Did I read that you used to work with a lot of informants? Yeah, yeah. Like anything, as a as a good detective, you'd always try to sort of build up a a, a working relationship with informants. And yeah, I sort of um, had some reasonable results. Um, and you know, these people, yes, they were criminals, but they decided to give some information. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that side of it. I, I think the whole thing of being a detective, that back in the day, that's what it was all about. It was about running informants, um, sort of like you're very much on a line, but you're not crossing the line. Uh, and that's where you, you, you sort of focus your attention. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to be a detective in Plasto in East London, which again was a very good sort of like working working ground uh, for building up that, that relationship as a detective and see, an experience. See, for an informant, do they still get to give you information, but get away with what they're doing themselves? Uh, no, because at the end of the day, they knew that, you know, if if they'd been involved in stuff, then that's not a green light that they get away with, with stuff. Do you know what I mean? So, um, and and it's a, it's a difficult one, you know, it's a, it's a difficult one because at the end of the day, you, you're not really knowing what they're doing, but they know that, you know, they if they get caught, they get caught. How do you befriend an informant? Is it catching them and then talking to them in the station? Or do they come to you? Various ways. Uh, they might just pick the phone up and phone, and then you just pick the phone up, and it's just by pure luck that you 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 hit off. Do you know what I mean? It's just by pure luck. Or they might have been arrested or whatever. So, so there's all sorts of... But, but having said that, there's all sorts of reasons why informants um, will talk. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. Do you think... Do you lose respect for people like that? Or do you try and nourish them to say that they're doing a good job how does what, what's your mindset get into that kind of world i think um i suppose in a way it builds your credibility up as a detective because you might have some informants and um comes come with that there's jealousies because people will think oh you know he might he's got a, a couple of informants and one thing and another do you know what i mean so um i i used to view it as like it was part of being a detective in those in that time i mean it's totally changed now because obviously there are particular units that that deal with it so it's taken away from a detective in the normal office but in the normal office you were part of being a detective was that you had to go out there you had to meet people you had to talk to people um get your face known around the area and then and then eventually sort of like if people come across and want to give you information then you've got to like look after that information and protect them and all that sort of stuff yeah they say there's no honour amongst fees but back in the like, 70s 80s they said that it was like a code where nobody snitches kind of get put in ditches but nowadays yeah. it's kind of it's like um, there's probably more informants than police officers now like do you did, did you see a massive shift from 70s 80s was it harder to get an informant in the 80s when it would be now or is it just the same well I, I mean my my sort of dealing with informants finished sort of round about I would suggest about 2000 and 2006 potentially 
that's when that, that's when I finished. Um, but I would say that we, when you go back on or about thieves, there was the old school criminal very much was they weren't they didn't like drugs they didn't like to get involved in drugs they were but yet they were quite happy probably to have a shotgun and go across the pavement and rob a bank but uh, when it came to drugs they didn't have that i think in time they suddenly realized that it was probably easier to make money in drugs than what it was like uh, doing like doing your armed robberies and all that sort of stuff yeah. and i think that's where it sort of shifted because the money was was bigger so in the nineties, then were you enjoying your job? Were you loving it? There was no stresses. You're happy catching drug dealers, murderers. Yeah, um, it, uh, I mean, when I when I moved into, uh, I moved up, I moved up north to Cleveland, um, and uh, with, with Judy, my wife, and two children, we started, you know, and, and it was great. Uh, and then I moved into um, what was known as the Regional Crime Squad at that time, uh, and that's when I sort of got really introduced uh to the undercover element of it um and and then you know like like i mentioned in the book i met up with somebody who i've known for a long time and i knew was a uh, was an undercover officer but i didn't really know what he specialized in and he was the one that introduced me into this dark world um so yeah, so and that was the first time you went undercover when you went into the dark side of it. No, no. Uh, when I first went in, I, I did just sort of normal drugs, guns, and what was that, that like? Uh, yeah, it was good. It was okay. I enjoyed it. Um, I mean, it, it's exhilarating to be sort of like as a criminal, you're in amongst them all, and you know they get caught and one thing or another. So yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Um, but where I really got a lot of good satisfaction is when I went into the dark world. Um, that's when I really sort of, um, because I had to work so hard um, to be accepted. Not that I didn't have to work hard in the, in the other stuff, but with this, this is a total different ballgame. Who do you think it's easier to manipulate, kind of the crime, criminal, like drug dealers, murderers, or pedophiles? Um, Who was it harder to be accepted into? Definitely the uh, the predators, child sex offenders. Yeah, yeah. With Why I was that? Um, I think because they've got a lot to lose. Um, they're very cautious. They're very suspicious. They're very suspicious because they they don't necessarily think you're a police officer. They're more likely to think you're a journalist, and they're gonna they're gonna be named and shamed that type of thing. Um, so they're quite they're quite insular, and and sometimes what you've got to do is you've got to sort of manipulate them to sort of be accepted. And it's so difficult because you'll only have a small window of opportunity to do it, and and then if you do, if you're not successful, then theoretically you're finished because you can't go back in. Do you know what I mean? So there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure to sort of research him or him. It was ma mainly males I was up against, but you're researching these males, and you've got to like identify. Well, where am I going to meet them? Am I going to meet them on a bus? Am I going to meet them in a cafe? Um, and then what am I going to do? because it's all about your communicational skill and it's all about sort of trying to quickly get a hook where they're going to speak to you. And and it might be three months down the line where you actually talk about stuff that you don't want to talk about. Do you know what I mean? And and so, you, you know, it's just like I can't go up to you, James, in the street and say, hi, my name's Ian, I'm a paedophile, because it doesn't work that way. So it's that, it's that very drip, drip sort of like uh, way that you would do it. Mm -hmm. So you've went from... Two new kids, wife, pretty decent job, undercover, catching criminals, and then an offer comes to you. What was going through your mind then when you said, look, you want to go into this dark world where to try and catch paedophiles, save children? Did you question it or did you, did you just accept straight away? Um, it's, it's a big thing. Um, and I think in the certainly in the undercover world, um, you were always told that you would never tell your partner or, or wife what you were doing. And, and it was more of a safety mechanism. Um, but in this world, it, it, it's really different, you know. And I, I felt that if I was going to go into this sort of arena, then I, Julie had a right to know what I was going to be doing, potentially. Um, because I think it's important, you know, because there would be dark days there would be days where you know like it it wasn't either going well or um i'm with somebody and he's telling me this that and the other and it's not nice do you know what i mean and then 
you know, if I go home and my wife doesn't know what I'm doing, then potentially she's thinking, well, what's wrong with you? Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, so it was, it was one of them where I, I I had to go through certain steps where I I wanted my wife to sort of understand what I was thinking of doing. And you're right, we had two young children, uh, and that in itself presents all sorts of problems and, and, and issues. Um, and, and I thought to myself, no, you know, like if if Julie's okay, then I know at least then I know we're all right. Um, and Julie's a very strong character, so you know, Julie will certainly like keep me keep me straight. And what did she say? Was she a hundred percent backing of your decision? She was. Uh, she was worried about obviously me bringing stuff home. Um, and um, I said, no, that, that wouldn't happen. I, you know, uh, I would always try to like um, create like little barriers where everything would be left at the office or the work or wherever I was deployed. Do you know what I mean? Um, sadly, there's times when I've got to have a phone. Whoever invented the phone, do you know what I mean? It was a nightmare because the mobile phone I had to have with me 24-7 because some of these individuals, they just phone you straight away and say, look, I want to do this. Do you know what I mean? And then that's your safety mechanism to sort of hopefully tell your operational team, look, something's going to happen tomorrow and we've got a plan and we've got to prep. Do you know what I mean? So there's times where as much as I try to keep everything at the office, there was times where I had to have it at home. What what year did you start that scene? Uh, this would have been 92. And at least I say it wasn't as bad back then, what was that, where it was more people were talking about, it was kind of swept under the carpet. How many, it was only four that joined that unit at that stage? Yeah, um, if you can imagine, you know, uh, being an undercover officer, everyone loves to buying the drugs and the guns and that excite because it's like yeah, adrenaline. But when you're actually sort of wanting to infiltrate a child sex offender, then talking about it, it it's not really a talkable subject. No one wanted to talk about it. And, and a lot of people wouldn't want to do this work, A, because they were married, um, B, they had children, and C, they couldn't force themselves to actually speak to these people because they, did, they hated them. They didn't want to speak to them. So to do this work, you know, um, I knew there was a lot of barriers I had to sort of overcome. Um, and, and I think that was the challenge, you know. Uh, the challenge was that I knew that not many people could do it and that we were like a little family within a family uh, and we, we helped out each other. What was the first job or assignment? How do you then build up relationships with sex yeah. offenders how does um, that happen the first time well if, if i can say that the first thing i had to do was i had to look at images and when you look at an image of a child whether it's a naked child or whether it's a child that that's subject of like uh, sexual abuse it's not nice um but i had to look at it to train myself so that if someone showed me a picture or show me, someone showed me a video that i would like hide my sort of my inner self where I, I don't like this, I don't want to see this, do you know what I mean? And what I've got to do is I've got to look through the picture, look through the video and literally block everything out and sort of have this acting wrong. Do you know what I mean? So you've got to take it so extreme because if you think about it, if I can't deal with that image, then I would say that um, a predator would identify me and who's to say I might put a child at risk. So we would always say, if you can't deal with images, you can't deal with it. So your first big hurdle are your images. And, and, and it's horrendous because you've got to keep looking at them. You've got to like sort of have thought processes in your head uh, to overcome sort of like the, the, the nastiness of it. And your face has got to like shut everything out. Do you know what I mean? Because they look at your face, your body language, and if they don't like what they see, that's it. So <clears throat> if they were to show you videos or fucking throat's getting dry listening that's kind of rough to understand that like if someone's showing you videos or photos like and you turn away that's a sign that you're undercover or you're a journalist that yeah i mean it could be anything but they they, they certainly wouldn't wouldn't like it because if you're on one hand you're saying i love i love children from a sexual point of view and yet someone shows you a picture and you don't like looking at it so that contradicts what what you're wanting to be um so that's why it's so important. And then, of course, your hardcore stuff, your videos, the explicit, the screams of a child. I mean, it's horrendous, It's horrendous, James. Do you know what I mean? And, but at the end of the day, you have to train yourself to deal with that. If you can deal with that, that's fine. Then you've got to talk about it. Then you've got to talk about it sexually. So it's not just about seeing an image. Do you know what I mean? So an image could be in front of you for a while, 
whilst you're engaged with this individual. And you've got to condition your mind to be calm yeah. in those situations or else you'll blow a cover potentially. Yeah. And you don't and you don't know when that image is going to come. Do you know what I mean? So um, you know, they could just like drop it on you. Or you might know it's going to happen, so you can like, do you know what I mean? Prepare yourself, but sometimes you don't, and it's just there. What do you think? Do you know what I mean? So, Who was the first kind of predator or sex offender you came across? When, when you knew that they were a sex offender and showing you those images and videos, what then is going through your mind? Did you Were you ever thinking I could kill you, or were you trying to be as professional as you could be to then get to the bigger targets and try and expose more people? Yeah, I, I think the biggest the biggest enjoyment I got from this was actually seeing them how they really were because when you when police when normal police go and interview them they're just like a normal human being uh, when probation service speak to them interview them they're just a normal be human being when i see them they are in their offending mode they're switched on and they are like a coiled spring so i can actually see how they hacked at the at the height of when they're out there when they're watching a boy or a girl, um, when they're in the street, when they're in a retail park, when they're on a beach, do you know what I mean? When they're really switched on, that's how y you see them as they really are. And when they're engaging, when they're talking to you uh, uh, quite explicitly about, about sex and stuff like that, um, that to me, I think that's brilliant because I've actually managed to get into into their, their environment and I can actually see how they really are. Could you go to a park or a swimming and, and notice paedophiles straight away? I think sometimes you can. I mean, I think it. You know, when you're when you're with an individual and you go to a park, you always you, what I, what I always say now to people is, wherever a child wants to go, then potentially a predator can be, because predators will always go where children are. So if it's a park and if there's a train that goes round the park, or if there's a pond and they're feeding the ducks. That's a way of like communicating, whether it's to, you know, to a parent or to an actual child itself. Retail parks, retail parks are, are now, if you think most retail parks now, they cater for everything. So they cater for children. So children can go into shops and play games and stuff like that. They're so focused on playing the game that they're oblivious to their surroundings. So a predator can just get as close as possible. And, and there were certain predators that I were with that just wanted to get so close that they could potentially sort of like smell that that child do you know what i mean because that's what really excited them what to try and understand like sex offenders and predators their, their methods like there's a lot of them deranged there's a lot of them quite smarter than what people give them credit for like you you see these pedophile hunters videos and they're quite some of them ain't right in the head where you see them and you think they're not right. Did did you see that? Or was a lot of people you would never expect to be predators? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the days are gone, and certainly when we when we started doing it, that you, it's like you you have your own sort of stereotypical sort of person that you think is, but they might not necessarily be the person. Um, I mean, when I was a kid growing up, you know, my mum sort of gave me this description of a person that I used to keep. I had to keep well away from. Um, not because they were a sexual pervert or anything like that, but it, that was just that horrendous sort of picture. So I had a picture in my head of like what I thought was a dangerous person. Now, uh, I would suggest when we started doing it, and even now, they come from all walks of life. So they can be professional people, non-professional, you name it. it. It's different now. How did you get to build this trust like, at the start? How did, you, did they approach you or did you approach them? How does it work? Right, if I, if, if I give you an example then... Um, so most of the people I were up against were quite high risk, which means they'd been in prison, they'd come out, and it was a case of all your agencies were monitoring them and sort of like basically protecting the community. But they still have a right to be out in the, in the public domain. So what, I, um, what they would do is they would sort of um, research them, they would follow them, build up a bit, a bit of um, a sort of like a pattern of where they go, um, and then it was down to me to to basically work out, well, where is the safest place for me to engage and have a conversation with this individual or or initially to try and sort of speak to somebody and then sort of build that relationship. So, for example, this particular one person uh, went into a, a cafe and would always be there for around about half an hour ish. 
And I knew that was a place where I had to literally go in. We did some more research because he had a particular phone. So I had the same phone. And then it was a case of like, I've got to use my personal skills to try and engage with him. So I go in, I go in there, very short. I just go in there. He's there. There's other people about. I had a carrier bag. I had a mobile phone, which was exactly like, like his. And I said, oh, would you mind just having a look at that? whilst I get myself a cup of tea. And, and I know that when I was waiting for my tea, he was looking at the carrier bag, he saw the mobile phone, and when I came back, I then said, oh, I'm having a real problem trying to get me contact numbers on the phone, and I had a paper with all my contacts and stuff like that. They love to be in control. They love to be in charge of somebody, and they love to show that they've got, um, how can I say, sort of like um, knowledge and experience in something. So he grabbed the phone, and he just entered all my all my numbers in the phone and we started talking, talking, all that sort of stuff. And then we build that relationship up and then we then carry on. And once you start building that relationship, obviously it'll get darker, deeper and the, yeah. the, the kind of, the hell kind of begins. Like when you start going through that, how do you train yourself to be calm in those situations? One things, if you're talking about hearing kids screaming, I've got kids, so when you say that, it's yeah. in my mind thinking, fuck I understand that you've got to do that job, but how do you condition your mind to, to then, yeah, to, uh, to adapt to that? Basically, you 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 have to be professional, okay? Because I know that at the end of the day, if I do anything wrong, then the operation finishes, but then it paints me in a bad light. So I know that what I've got to do is I've got to remain calm. I've got to get the evidence because I know that this is the one opportunity where his guard is down because he's comfortable with me. So. It's a case of like, you've just got to, and again, you've got to be very careful with this because at the end of the day, what you're doing is you've got to have a profile that he's going to ask you about. So I, I like boys between the ages of seven and 10. What I've got to do is I've got to be, give examples of my offending behavior and how I met those individuals and how I broke down their barriers and how I had sex with them. Because he wants to know that. Now, all what I say is a lie. Do you know what I mean? What he could tell me is a truth. So, but what I've got to be very careful is because of the law, I've got to like only give him so much and then he'll give me something and then I might give him something else. If I keep feeding him with stuff, then potentially uh, at court, they might turn around and say, well, look, you know, you've overstepped the mark and you know, we're going to throw the case out. Do you know what I mean? So you've got to be very careful how you drip stuff in. And there's a lot of court cases, do you think the sentences are a bit lenient in my eyes? In my eyes, they're very lenient. People getting two or three years. I know people get done for so much less, like maybe drugs or whatever. Yes, drugs is bad, but I've seen friends getting eight and nine years for a bit of a coke or whatever, and then you're getting paedophiles out in fucking two years, and you're thinking, wait a minute, he's raped kids. I think there was a guy who had over 500,000 images of kids and get 12 months, and I'm thinking. I think the problem is um, you've probably got, well, you can't put a figure on how many people are, are online because I think online is a wash of it. It's so easy to get material. Um, and because there's so many out there, you'll have all sorts of various organizations, police informants, uh, sorry, police um, enforcement areas that are specifically looking at online investigations, that they'll be getting loads of people. But at the end of the day, at the end, there's not enough prisons. Do you know what I mean? So... So there'll be people with thousands and thousands of indecent images that ultimately, at the end of the day, probably would have gone to prison 20 years ago, but more than likely might not go to prison now. Because there's so many. Because there's so many of them. And then that's just people who are online. There's a hardcore, and I, I, I think there's, even now, my this is just my view, I think there is a lot of hardcore people out there who won't go near it online because they know that there's a good chance they might get caught so they'll stick away from the computer. But they were doing that 20 years ago. There was many people I, I, I uh, was up against that they would say, look, keep away from the computer because you're going to get caught. Keep away from it. So it was very much, that's, they liked that face-to-face -face sort of element to it. How many different levels of sex offenders are there? Has it all come under the one kind of brush? Uh, well... I think all child sex offenders are all the same because if you think about it, that all those are, are, that are online and are looking at images, that child at that image has been sexually abused. So that's a victim. Um, and then you've got people who will, 
Well, if you break it down, there'll be family abuse. So there'll be sexual abuse within the family. And then you'll have um, predators that will go out there and will be friends, uh, vulnerable women. And then they'll meet up with the children and rape the children. Um, and then you've got your online. Um, so so there's, there's just a wash of them. There's just so many of them. What kind of, what's the longest case you've worked undercover for? Uh, I did a job that went on for about a year. But we were looking at different people, different types of people. Um, and, um, you know, I was, I was in and out. And, and, and th there was one particular person that was very high risk, very dangerous, regarded as one of the worst ones about at that time. And um, he, he, you know, we, we managed to uh, make disclosures to various people because he was getting very close. Um, and, and we had to take that decision to sort of like make that disclosure. So say when you're going on a case for a, a full year, yeah. when you're 10 years deep into that job, how does your whole energy change? How does your so whole persona change towards your wife, towards your kids? Like when you're going into the job at the start, you're probably loving it, getting a wage and thinking, this is great, I'm catching criminals. But then when you go so far deep into the darkest side of the world you can ever go, how does that change everything in your life? Um, it, it does change you. It changes you as a parent. It makes you more aware of your surroundings and where you're going and where your children are, um, you know, because it does change you. Um, I, you know, I, I think I had support when I started doing this, uh, doing this work, uh, which I think was, was important because I was able to sort of do the work I was doing, then speak to the psychologist and he was able to look at me and sort of identify whether I needed to do anything to ensure that my family life was safe. Do you know what I mean? Um, because if you're spending 12 hours speaking to a predator and they're talking nonstop about child sex and how they break down the barriers of a child and how they do this, that, and the other, um, you know, you, you, you're listening to this and then suddenly you think, oh my God, you know, like I'm listening to this for, for, for so long. Am I going to change? Do you know what I mean? Uh, you know, and it was one question that I, I did say to the psychologist because I said, like, I'm, I'm hearing so much stuff here. At the end of the day, you know, like, am I going to change? Uh, and he said, you ain't going to change because you said you're different. When you say it's changed, actually become a predator yourself? I think, uh, well, you, you're worried that you're going to start enjoying it. Suddenly sort of enjoy what you're listening to and, and, and potentially look at your children in a different light. I mean, it's, it's quite shocking, you know, because you're thinking, oh my God, is it going to happen to me? Um, but the psychologist would say, at the end of the day, what you've got to understand is you've got to overcome so many barriers to get where they want to be. And when you get to the first barrier, which is basically, do I, do I like children? You're going to say no, which is what I did. I, 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 I said no. So it stops. Do you know what I mean? Whereas a predator, they'll knock down all these barriers to get where they want to be. And that's and that's why they they love it because they'll they'll knock down that uh, that barrier because they've they, they've seen a child that they want to have sex with now they've got to try and like get close to them so they knock that barrier down and so on and so on and so on. Fuck's sake! To have those thoughts in to think that you could have potentially be one. It, is... Well, because I think at the end of the day, I think it, it it's frightening purely because because it was so full on. Do you know what I mean? And like you're listening to this all the time. And I knew I was comfortable. Do you know what I mean? But sometimes you need assurances. Yeah, assurance. Uh, I knew I was okay. Um, and uh, no, I, I just think that, and I think what really helped was, um, certainly from 92 onwards, we had this psychological mechanism support for undercover officers. And I think as time went on, that went for policing in general. And I think professional services are the same because you do need support because you you're you could be affected by it you'll have that vicarious trauma and all that sort of stuff um and you need that help soon you're in that what so explain what's a pedophile ring then for people who don't know is right. it people all connected everywhere or what is that actually right okay so well in in the pedophile world it there's no such thing as a pedophile ring why does it get used, that term get used right. all the time? I, I think a lot of it's down to sort of like the authorities. The authorities introduced what I would say as as a ring um, and then um, sort of paedophilia itself. 
and then obviously grooming. So those three terms were very much created by aphorists as such. So a ring is actually a network. And what, what, um, what a, a network does is that they will identify each other that they have a similar interest. So you might have, for example, you might have someone in Newcastle, you might have two people in Liverpool, and then you might have one person in London. What links them all together is that they all like girls between the ages of seven and 10, for example. Now, they may well have met either in prison, out of prison, or where someone might be convicted, someone might not be convicted, but they've, they've just built up this little bit of a, a connection. And then what happens is they will meet up together and they will either share images or they will either go to various places and, and visit. It used to be known as spotting. You'd go to a retail park with your, your, your fellow network and then you would spot and you would look at particular children that, that suited your particular interests. So when they're looking for kids at their interest, do they kidnap them or how, what do they do? I mean, there are, sadly, there are people out there who, I, I always say that there's two bits, well, there's, there's, there's a few particular different types of, of predators. You've got one that wants that, they want to like identify a vulnerable woman who's got access to children. They want to spend time sort of befriending them. They want to spend time sort of like Getting, a, getting sort of having that sort of support, knowing that they are a trustworthy person. Once that wall of bricks has come round, and no matter who comes in and tries to knock those bricks down, saying, for example, Ian's not nice, Ian's not good, um, but they say, oh, no, he, he's fine, he's good to me, he helps me, he gives me money, he gives me this, that, or the other. Then eventually, once they've identified that, then they move on to the child, okay? If it takes a year, it takes a year because it's the thrill of the chase. On the other side, you've got people who, I ain't got time for all that. I'm going to go out, and if I see somebody and I like them, I'm going to snatch them, I'm going to rape them, and then I've got this big problem. What am I going to do now because I've raped this child? Am I going to murder them, am I not? You know, the, the example of Roy Whiting, you know, the, in Sussex, the Sarah Payne, um, quite a distressing case, but at the end of the day, you know, he just went out, he kitted his van out, he went out, she just sadly was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, um, yeah. But that's what it is, people have got these needs that they're willing to just yeah. act on it straight away where they're yeah. snatching But kids. I would say that whether you snatch a child, rape them, kill them, whether you spend a year sort of like befriending a, a parent and then moving on to the child, they're both equally as dangerous. Do you know what I mean? That it's just that one takes longer than the other. So see when you're kind of befriending these people and hearing these stories and were you ever in that sort of situation where they said, right, I'm going to snatch a child today or bringing childs to you? Right. The, 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 only, the, the time that really, I would say, uh, and, and it's only ever happened once in the whole time I've been doing this in the country. And that was when we, um, I befriended somebody and we eventually... Uh, moved into a particular network and when we moved into this network on the day that I met these people for the very first time and there were six of them they brought a 12 year old boy into the flat and they wanted me to have sex with that boy so what do you what happens there then so again what you've got to do is um, you always think child safety because if you think about it James if I if I allowed that boy to be sexually abused what would the public think of me? You know, I've... I've yeah, you're no different. I'm no different, am I? So I have a duty of care to that child. On the flip side, when I'm out and about spotting with, with a predator, I have a duty of care to that predator. Because if he's going to get assaulted by somebody, I have a duty, because he's in my presence. I'm a police officer. Do you know what I mean? So it, it, it's a difficult one. But certainly um, in a flat with a child... I have a duty of care to protect that child. Under no circumstances must anything happen to that child. Um, and, you know, that's where all the pressure comes then because you've got six men in there. Horrendous. Because I spent six hours in that flat. We were seeing images. They were analysing me. They wanted to know what I did, how I offended, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. And then they, they really are honed on to me. And then... The more I sort of get accepted, more people were coming in. So I started off with two males 
And then because I was getting on so well with them and because they were, I was comfortable with them and they were comfortable with me, six males are there. Then suddenly the main guy gives me a tour of his flat and talks all sorts of sexual innuendo with what, what they do with a boy and all this sort of stuff. And then eventually he says, look, the boy's going to come into the flat and, um, you, you know, uh, you're going to be the first one that's going to have sex with. Oh, a kid at 12? What, how did, where did they get the kid at 12? Because sadly there's children out there who are vulnerable, who are targeted, who are sort of like... Groomed. Yeah, they're, they're basically sort of... All their barriers are broken down, whether it's gifts, presents... <laughs> whatever it might be do you know what i mean so and then the boy is there and the and and the boy is used to that environment yeah which is the sad thing about it all is you're expecting that you're expecting someone to come in who's going to be horrified screaming and shouting but there's no screaming or shouting because the boy he this was comfortable for him this was his environment because he'd been so well sort of groomed uh, uh, a friend has actually just passed away he released a book called uh, meat rack boy where kids as young as 10 used to be in Soho and he used to just yeah. get into cars with men with suits and uh, they accepted that life because they were abused at five and six years old where it became normal. Yeah, and of course, sadly, in them days, they were known as rent boys and, and you know, because and, and, I know the particular area in Soho that was used, it was only like a very short couple of streets, but again, you had all sorts of people going there, picking people up. So when you're put under that sort of pressure at that environment, how do you, how do you, defuse the situation right well it, what happened with this particular one we had a bit of a clue that a child might come into the flat and that was introduced to me by by the main guy that i met and i met him on a bus for 20 minutes this is how it all started um and then once we befriended and once we got on and and, and bit various things developed then as we're driving down he tells me that I might be here a lot longer than I think because there's going to be a, a child coming to the flat. Now, I've got an operational team around me, um, so I sort of like create a sort of like a little bit of a delay mechanism because I need to tell them, look, there's just going to be a child coming into the flat, so we need to plan for when I say something, you've got to act on it. And And, and the story I basically had was that I used to look after my mum and I was a carer. But if I'm going to be late, then I've got to make a call to get someone else to look after the care responsibilities. Do you know what I mean? So, and because I would introduced that from the moment we're traveling down to actually in the flat with the main guy and he tells me, you know, like, we might have a surprise, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, I might have to tell you know, uh, someone about my, my care responsibility. Oh, yeah, we know all about that. So that's all natural. Do you know what I mean? So when the boy, I know the boy's going to come in, then I've got, it's about me creating the right time to actually say what I want to say to the operational team in full view of all the suspects um, and then hope that they can get to me so it's all about timing. It's all about, I make the call, the child's going to come in. Thankfully, the main guy ushers the boy to me. He's got his arm around me. I've got my arm around him. So I know he ain't going anywhere. I know I'm protecting him because I have a duty of care to that boy. And then what I've got to do then is just delay everything, slow everything down so that as time goes on, I know the police are going to come in the house. Now, that's where the pressure is like, it's through the roof, James. It's through the roof because I've got six predators there who are absolutely, they've gone. Do you know what I mean? They're, they're sexually sort of so perverse and active. We'd spend six hours looking at all these sort of child images. The computer's a wash of, of um, material. I've got evidence all over the, all over the floor and all this sort of stuff. Um, and yet at the end of the day, I've got to hold this, this boy and I've got to protect this boy. I can't take back Sadly, I can't take back what, what's happened to the boy previously. Do you know what I mean? It's the here and the now. I've got to, all I know is that whilst I'm here, no one's going to touch him and that he's safe. Um, and, and, but then it's a cat and mouse game because at some point I've got to make a decision because if the police don't come, then I've got to come out of wrong. 
So I've got to come out of role and say, right, okay, people, just to let you know, I'm a police officer and you're all under arrest. Is that, that how, if, no, if that, yeah. no. But that's what that, that's what's going through your head. Yeah. Going through your head is I've got to save the boy. I've got to protect him. No one's going to touch him. The police know about it. The police are coming. Why aren't they here? Because time just slow. Everything slows down, and it's like, and no matter what I how I try to create the the actual incident in the book, really didn't do it justice. Because if if I if I said how it really was, I don't think anyone would have read it. That fucking poor boy, man. Yeah. 12 years old. <sighs> so, and then, of course, the police come in and then it's like, it's a relief, isn't it? It's a relief that the police have come in, everything gets protected, boy gets taken away, and, and that's it. But, you, you, you know, you, you, your heads, I can't, it was fantastic being in that environment purely because I was seeing these people how they really were. Do you know what I mean? Evil. Evil people who who are who have no real sort of like compassion for children. Remorse, nothing. No, nothing. They, they just want to have they just want to have sex with these with this boy. Do you know what I mean? So it was it was I know it sounds it sounds awful, but it, it was great to be in that environment to actually see how they really were, because I knew how they really were. They were dangerous. Um, they were horrendous people. Um, and, and really, at the end of the day, I knew what kept me going was the fact that I know that you're all going to get locked up. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So that's what that's what keeps you going. And then, of course, if you save one child, which obviously is, is the purpose of the book, um, you save one child, then it becomes an obsession. You want to save more. Do you know what I mean? You feel as though, well, hold on a minute. I've been in, in the most horrendous situation I know I can do this. Do you know what I mean? And that's what keeps you going. Yeah, I can kind of understand that, but that you've seen a 12-year-old kid where you've saved them from being raped from yeah. grown adults where you think, if you walk away now, how many more kids have you let that happen to? Then you sort of blame yourself. Because I'm trying to understand the method of thinking of going back to yeah. that madness and that, that evilness. Yeah, that... I, I think because what you what it is, is you, 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 you save one child and you think, do you know what? I can do this because I've just done it. So I know that this is worst case scenario and, and this has never happened since. So in England and Wales, we've never had this situation before. Um, and it's worst case scenario. It's what it's, it's, it's an investigated officer's sort of nightmare to have like a child in a flat and you've got an operation going, like when are we going to like arrest them, you know, because we don't want anything to happen to the child. Or you. Or me. Yeah, but but child comes yeah. at the top. First, yeah, of course. What about how much evidence do you need to gather first of all to get a conviction or to take it to court? If it's like if somebody says I, I'm a, I'm sexually attracted to kids or I've, they've got yeah. all the evidence, that's not enough to convict someone. Not what? necessarily, no. Because at why the end is of, that? Um, well, I think certainly uh, prior to 2003, the legislation that we had and we had to work with was quite poor, and I think most people within the judicial system will, would probably support that um and there was a lot of campaigning a lot of planning because they knew that they had to deal with all sorts of things relating to child uh, sexual activity whether it's sex tourism whether um you know and, and, the, and 2003 when you're looking at grooming and facilitating and taking photos and then sort of like supplying them possession of them all we had back in the day was the Vagrancy Act of 1824, which basically said that if you're a public nuisance, then we can arrest you. Or we've got 1956 Sexual Offences Act, do you know what I mean? So, which, are very, which were very limited. So see, when you're uh, getting co convictions, hmm. do you have to give evidence at court? Are you still behind a screen? Do they know who you are then? Yeah, uh, well, at times I had to give evidence, and at times uh, I'd either be behind a screen or I'd do a video link. Um, so yeah, but that was part and parcel of, of, of the job really, you know, you, you should expect that you might have to go to court, that you should have to go to court. And I used to love the fact that I could go to court because I could basically paint a picture to say like what they really were. I used to wear technical equipment as well, which is, um, another big thing. What do you mean? Uh, well, being recorded. So yeah. if, if I'm, if I've got recording on me, then the risk is ramped up even more because, they are very touchy-feely people. 
Um, so it was you as well? Oh, yeah. So they might touch me in a way of like trying to work out whether I've got any like recording equipment mm -hmm. on me. Um, so, you know, but but I used to purposely wear technical equipment because it would, A, it would protect me, but it also protects them in a way because like I can't say anything that is untoward. Do you know what I mean? So, um, and not only that, it would reduce me potentially spending so many days in a, in a, in a witness box at court. And you coming across these people and they're giving you information that kind of the kids that they like from kids I'd imagine yeah. weeks old to 12 to 13 like, like how how do you go from staying calm to then understand that you need to get a conviction like I'd imagine was there any times you ever felt like crying when people are telling you the um, shit things that they've done or did you just become I think so it, cold? It, it goes back to when you join the police when you join the police um, they always say that y your job stops when you actually go to court you give your evidence and that's it you have no control over what a person gets for a sentence uh, because if you did you would be get, you, you, you literally go potty because there'd be times when you think oh I've got a case that's nailed on and they don't go to prison you'll have another case that well, I ain't going to get a result. And you get a result and they go to prison. Do you know what I mean? So it, it's so really when you come to sort of being professional, you be professional, you take it as far as you can, you go to court, you give your evidence and that's it. It's out of your hands. You have no control over the jury. You have no control over the judge. And really at the end of the day, what you know, they get what they get. Now, that particular group I mentioned in the flat, I think they got between four and seven years. They did half of that, I think. And then they came out and they carried on again. So that's a, an established network that ain't going to stop. You know, they're not going to stop. And they don't stop. So what should be put in place to, do you lock them up longer? Do you cut off their balls? Do you, do you, do you, like I know they do that in America, they chemically cut straight, but it doesn't yeah, really, it doesn't really do anything. But so what should be in place then for, is that a psychological thing that can never be fixed? Or what's your whole outlook of it all that could try and improve that to keep, kids protected or do you think it's just going to get worse I, I, don't, I don't think you're going to stop it and I, I don't think it's it's something that you know you're going to say do you know what we're going to wipe this all out and, and it's never going to happen again it's a bad dream uh, but it isn't it's going to be there and it will be there for life forever so what we've got to do is um, I think it's a, a certainly my view is I think it's a lot about awareness and prevention it's about educating parents because there's a lot of, sadly, there's a lot of parents out there who are vulnerable and potentially they're the ones who are more at risk because A, they've got something that a predator wants, which is a child. And what they've done is they've probably been in all sorts of sad sort of circumstances, which means that they are very much now vulnerable and more likely to be targeted by a predator. So it's a case of like making them aware that, you know, be mindful of dating sites. Be mindful of on, online, whatever the online site is. It could be problem parenting. It could be, you know, bad parenting, you know, advice on children, that type of thing. They infiltrate these sort of networks to try and identify a parent that's got a child that fits their profile. So when I'm with these predators, I will have a profile for a boy or I'll have a profile for a girl of various ages or whatever, because I know that I have to mirror that to them because otherwise they're not going to talk to me. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it's so the predators aren't just going after the kids, they're, they're grooming the parents to get to the kids and that's a process that they're willing to go through because it's a chase for them. Yes, it is. That's fucked up, man. That's I, I mean, sadly, you've got those that haven't got time for all that. and, and But at the end of the day, you know, it's like anything. We want our children to basically live their lives, to enjoy life, to experience life. But sometimes we have to be very careful because it's like putting them on a rope, you know, like we, if we let them go off and we don't know where they are, do you know what I mean? It's difficult to pull the rope back because at the end of it, they might not be at the end of the rope. Do you know what I mean? They've gone. Why are they so well protected though, predators? Why are they not, why should you not be on a database that who's around you and who stays near you and who's in the schools and like, they're so well protected it's kind of sickening in a way well it's a lot better now James than what it so. was yeah because you've got Sarah's law so Sarah Payne basically sadly because of her death um, their, uh, her parents campaigned for Sarah's law which was basically sort of the right for families to know that there might be a predator living in the street do you know what I mean 
So, so you've got you've got that, and it's very much it works on a, on a par with Claire's law, which is again that that domestic violence sort of like awareness. Um, so there's a lot more organisations out there. Um, the schools are very sort of very switched on, and and you've got Bernardos, NSPCC. So you, there's loads of organisations out there, and self organizations as well where you've got say parents of victims who who want to help other victims do you know what i mean so they've created like groups and stuff like that so there's lots of opportunities for children to make more disclosures um for professional people to sort of like really understand what's going on um whereas i think back in the day there wasn't that and if you look at look at all the people now for argument's sake, um, if you've got people within the church area, um, professional people, teachers, doctors, police, um, you know, it, within the hospital arena as well, they were all people upstanding that people would look at and what they said was, was true. Do you know what I mean? Um, but there are predators hidden with, with, within those circles. There's, there's, yeah. there's predators hidden everywhere. But now I think there's more organizations out there. And I, and I think what's made a real difference as well is that the Jimmy Savile investigation, as much as it had probably a lot of pitfalls and a lot of problems, um, you had people that wanted to come out and say what was wrong, that they had been sexually abused. The sad thing about it, they couldn't do it when he was alive because if you think about it, you're talking about an individual who um, had awards, had uh, he had friends in government, he had it would raise millions of money, do you know what I mean? Well respected. And then you had victims who sadly, through being abused, had all sorts of complexities. So who are you going to believe? Someone with those complexities or are you going to believe Jimmy Savile? Do you know what I mean? So once Jimmy Savile had gone, then you didn't have that problem. And not only that, you had over a thousand people. Now, all these thousands of people, sorry, a thousand people that came forward and, and said that they were abused, they didn't know each other. Do you know what I mean? So there's no sort of like collusion. These are like... Yeah, thousands of people's different than somebody coming forward. And I think it made a difference. And I think then suddenly, suddenly it was a wake-up call. And I think... Sadly, I know that there were individuals that probably were, were caught up in this that probably weren't uh, offending, do you know what I mean? So there's always that danger. But at, at the end of the day, it was on a positive note, yeah? The victims could now come out and have a voice. It's like your child's sexual exploitation cases. You know, a lot of these kids were vulnerable, missing from home, had all sorts of problems and no one believed them. Uh, I had Barbara O'Hare on who was in the... She released the book The Hospital, The Horrors at Aston Hall. Um, the doctors had a checklist, kids from vulnerable homes, uh, addiction issues, because what happens is they used to sign the kids off as crazy. So when the kids used to run away and go to the police station, the police actually took the kids back because they were already signed off as mentally unstable. So it was just a checklist. So they were drugging the kids, experimenting on them, killing them, raping them. But some sick shit. And people need to understand this stuff goes on. You've lived it firsthand. Like... How can we educate people, the people that's watching now, to, for telltale signs, maybe at the park, at the swimming or out with schools? How do we, what's the telltale signs where people can maybe, there's red flags, is there any? Well, I would say any, any parent that meets somebody online, just just think before you start sort of like really engaging. Always try to, I know it's difficult, but always try try to take a step back. You know, if someone wants to give you a top-up voucher for your phone, for argument's sake, you know, how many people realistically want to give you a top-up voucher for your phone? The only reason why they do it is because they want you to be hooked to them. All right? If, if I give someone £20 and it's a top-up for their phone, then they're more likely to phone me because I, I've taken the... the, the and it, it's not only that, it shows me in a good light as well because I'm prepared to give my last £20 to them. Yeah? So... Just be mindful of, and, and, and again, what they'll do is they'll, they'll test them. So they want to go to the shops for 10 minutes. Well, you go and I'll look after the child. They're quite cute. They won't go anywhere near the child. When mum comes back, there's no problem. Mum wants to go into town for an hour, comes back, no problem. They build it up, they build it up. So just, just be a little bit mindful and careful. Do you know what I mean? And if someone, if someone questions it, 
then ask them, why, why are you questioning it? Rather than, rather than dismiss it, you know, why, why, why do you think there's something wrong with him? What about kids who are on things like TikTok and Facebook and yeah. stuff like that? I know that's um, a, a prime example for grooming kids is TikTok. I know. I, I, I think any, any 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 online services with children now. Um, unfortunately, now I think it's too big now, isn't it? Stop. It, it's far too big, and I think with children now, children are, are far more sexual sexually aware. But sadly, it's easier for them to be groomed as well because of that sexual awareness. What do you think about them trying to bring the age of consent down for sex in the UK from 16? I think even some talks are 12. Right, well, back in the day... Um, 100 years ago, it used to be 10, 12. They changed it now, but then they're trying well, certainly, to bring it down um, again. Certainly in Europe, um, there are countries where uh, you can have sex with a child with a certain age and you can actually marry a child at, at the age of nine in Africa and stuff like that. So... In the, when we were in the European Union, there was a hardcore set of individuals who wanted to lower the age of consent, and they were campaigning it purely on the basis of, well, if we're in the European Union, we should all be one. So, And if you think about it, back in the day, it was 21, then it went to 18, then it went to 16. So there's campaigners out there who are always trying to look at opportunities to lower the age of consent. Now we're out of the European Union, obviously that might, might that might go. Do you know what I mean? So there's always you, you have, there are a, a set of our core predators out there who are always looking at ways of trying to manipulate the law, manipulate sort of opportunities to try and be accepted. You will never have a predator who will probably say to you, "I'm sorry for what I do." They're not sorry. What they'll do is they'll they'll look at themselves and they'll blame everybody about. Uh, apart from themselves so they'll blame the child because the child will have hot pants on or a short skirt do you know what I mean they'll, they'll always look for an excuse to blame the other person to say well they were encouraging it they etc etc never never what they wanted did you ever speak to the predators after they got a conviction to ask why or to ask no never no um th there was times when I had to go back in and speak to people um because they, um, we wanted to know what was going on within the group and stuff like that. But no, I never, I never spoke to them. Did you ever like to try? Did you ever keep tabs on them when you knew they were coming back out, or did you have to move to a different area because then your cover would be blown? How does it work? In yeah, I, I mean, I had to move on. Um, I mean, some of the places that, uh, I actually had to go into a prison and, and meet a predator there, um, and you can imagine the sort of complexities. I'm going into a prison. I'm going to have, uh, you know, like where they have their uh, meetings, and I'm 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 meeting someone in prison. Which, at the end of the day, you know, the problems there is that well, you know, they don't like predators, and yet I'm supposed to be like a sympathizer, or I could be one, and I'm actually meeting someone who's convicted. Do you know what I mean? So you can imagine all the sort of like the potential hostility and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, so there's that arena. Uh, and then you've obviously got opportunities that I meet other people, but yeah. Did your life ever come under any threat when you were undercover? No. Um, the, the, the only threat I had was uh, potentially, because again, potentially you've got an opportunity to be sexually assaulted because some of them will have a sexual sort of like behaviour where they'll have sex with a male. doesn't mean anything, but it's just their sort of like, their condition they just want to have sex so there's always a danger that someone's going to try it on with you and whatever so what you've got to do is you've got to sort of negate that which is easier said than done because if someone comes onto you and starts stroking your leg and you've got to push them away and say look you know you're not my type that's a carrot it's a carrot because they'll be thinking well he's okay in this particular area because it's an homosexual gay bar, but at the end of the day, he doesn't like me, so who does he like? Do you know what I mean? So that keeps the operation going. I can't hit him. Do you know what I mean? I can't, because if I hit him, then that's it, job's finished. So it's a case of dealing with that situation. I spent a weekend with an individual, and there's always a danger of, well, you know, even when I go into a flat, that flat, am I going to be drugged? There's always a danger of that. There's always there is a realistic danger of that, um, so so 
your, your, your sort of issues are, yes, I could be drugs. Yes, I could be raped. Yes, I could be sexually assaulted. Yes, someone could take my picture, which they did on a particular job. They, they took my picture because someone wanted to see who I was before they met me. And, you know, you have to deal with that. I mean, how are you gonna, how are you gonna deal with that? You know, someone takes your picture, it's downloaded, it's on the internet, it's gone. So everybody's kind of sitting in the same house, all kind of connected. Is that a lot? Is there a lot of this happening than people actually expect? Um, well, I think, I, I mean, I think it's still going on. I, I, I don't think it's just online. I think there's people working face to face and all that sort of stuff because they don't like online. So it's still going on, um, but yeah, it's it. it but it, but for. Um, for me to do this work, I can only say that, you know, like, because I had to go through so many hoops and so many barriers and all that sort of stuff, it, you know, it, it's not easy. What about the child trafficking stuff? Was people ever, ever offered to sell your kids? No, no. But, I mean, again, I, I mean, human trafficking and modern slavery, I mean, it, it's, it's rife, isn't it? Yeah. And it's so sad to think that people are paying money and not necessarily getting to the end do you know what I mean? You know, they might lose their life en route to, to where their dreams are. And then when they eventually get to where they think their dream is, it's a it's a different life. How did everybody else who was working on this, how did the, all the other agents get on yeah. with it, the ones you started with? Did they last the pace or did they quit? No, no, uh, we, we, all, we all naturally lasted our pace and then eventually, you know, like we left. Uh, the, the person that uh, introduced me to this sadly died a couple of years ago. Um, and, um, the others are, are, are still about, I, I, I mean, obviously I don't know where they are, but, um, yeah, we lived to, do you know what I mean? Our shelf life, which is, we did our service and, and that was it. How much do you try then protect your kids when they start hitting their teens and like going from nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, like yeah, how it, paranoid do you become? Do you get to loosen the reins a bit and let them, a little bit of freedom or just totally wrap, well, wrap them in cotton wool? Well, obviously, my, my children now are like, they're, yeah. they're grown up. They're, they're grown up, so, um, and, and they're away. Um, but it, it does change you, James. Do you know what I mean? You know, I, I'd be lying to say that, well, it doesn't, doesn't, it, it, you have a different outlook. Yeah. You're, you're more observant about if you go to a beach. Do you know what I mean? You might go to a beach and there might be a bit of a promenade and you'll see loads of people on the promenade and they've all got their cameras in their hand. Well, why have they got the cameras in their hand? Are they a tourist or are they taking pictures of children on the, on the beach? Do you know what I mean? So you do become more aware. Um, and again, it's like your surroundings, you know, um, just going to retail parks, uh, going to like tourism places. Yeah. You, you, you just, you, you're just so far more aware of your surroundings of where your children might be. There's a lot of the kids you saved didn't know that who you were. No, they wouldn't have known who I was. They wouldn't have known who I was. Um, and some of them wouldn't have even known that potentially they were victims. Um, you know, so sadly, the 12-year-old boy, I don't know who he is. I don't know where he is. He might be a predator now. Do you know what I mean? Um, or he might be married. He might have children, whatever. Um, yeah. There's a lot of these predators, has a lot of them abused as kids themselves or? Um, not necessarily. Um, because I know people say that. that oh, yeah, it, sometimes yeah. people will say, well, you know, like they were abused and they think it's the norm and they think, well, this is what happens in life. This is what I should be doing. Still have choices. Uh, they have choices. They have choices. When you're born, from the moment you're born upwards through life, you have a choice to do what you do. Um, so you're not you're not born with it. You know, so I know people say that, well, you know, you know, you, you, you must be born a, a child sex offender, you know, but, but you're not. You yeah. know, predators basically have a liking for children. And you'll find that they will be more comfortable talking to a child than what they would be potentially talking to an adult. It will all be like a little bit muzzy. Whereas when they were a child, they, they can communicate well, they feel comfortable uh, and and so that's that's where they they that's where their niche is. Did did anybody ever come forward to you and and tell you that obviously they're predators, but they would like to get help, or is there just no, no. one ever admitted to that what they're doing is wrong? No, I mean no. Well, first off, they would never ever say they've done anything wrong. 
because they not don't, one no because they don't see it as wrong okay um they like children because they are affectionate to children they educate children they spend more time with children they can communicate with children yes I, they have sex with children but that's all part of education that's their rationale all right so so no one's going to no one's going to turn around and say you know what no i shouldn't be doing this how hard is that to see the broken kids to 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 see the the nightmares that they're living like, i'd imagine that's the worst thing of being in that job to see kids yeah i, I mean sadly if you look at the the, C, the cse world the child sexual exploitation world um you've got children out there who basically because they get targeted at, at a young age say about 10 or 11 and, and that, as they get older they suddenly feel as though do you know what they, they see this like green light where they they think do you know what i, I want to stop this and then but suddenly they don't want to lose what they have which is your gifts your presents your clothes cash iphones ipads whatever it might be but they love the predator which means that if they walk away from it and they go back to family life they probably might not have anything they might have one present a year so so you've got you've got that problem which means that at the end of the day with predators what they'll do is and this this has a flip side because you'll have a predator that likes boys seven to ten when that boy reaches ten and their development and they're moving on then predators will li literally what they'll do is they'll hold on to that ten year old because they've worked hard to break down the barriers of that child and then what they'll do is they'll use him to facilitate younger boys to come in okay so they keep it going so with cse again what you'll do is you'll have girls 11 12 whatever they'll suddenly get to about 16 17 where they've had enough of all the complexities and all the problems that they've had that suddenly now they want to take a step back and be a facilitator to to bring younger children in did you ever f feel as if you were fighting a lost cause because it's so rife out there? Ian? Um, well, I, I mean, you could never, you can't stop it. Um, I think that the, the satisfaction I had was that, um, and it became a bit of an obsession because you save one child, then you want to save another one, then you want to save another one. Do you know what I mean? And and probably, dare I say it, because of the legislation, we probably were far more successful saving children than what we were getting convictions. Do you know what I mean? So. Um, so that's what kept you. That's what kept you going, is yeah. the, is the fact that you you know like you 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 had an opportunity to save children. How did your wife then, when you were in that job for twenty years, does that relationship break down, or does it just total try to support each other the best as you could? How does that work? Uh, my wife was was strong. My wife was a rock, and and she means a lot to me, um, and I owe a lot to her. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, I, I'm doing what I'm doing and Julie's is keeping the family together and Julie's running the house and everything like that. So, yeah. If she never supported you, do you think you'd have been in that job? I wouldn't have done that job because I made that decision from day one that if my wife wasn't comfortable with me doing it, then um, I would walk away from it. Do you know what I mean? Because um, I genuinely felt that I, I needed the support of my wife to... You know, and, and I desperately tried to to make sure that I didn't bring things home. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and there was the odd occasion when it did happen, but but generally speaking, I wanted to like sever it and keep it and keep it split. What about making friends and stuff when you're in that line of work? Did did you have many friends, or did you become so distanced towards people? Or did you, when you were in that environment, did you also question that they could be predators? Does he question everybody being a predator? At the end well, of that? I mean. I think that in certainly in the undercover world, we we became a family within a family because we very much depended on each other. Um, we we learnt from each other, uh, and they they were good characters. Uh, I mean, the the guy that really introduced me, um, he, I mean, he was a lovely fella. But I knew him when I was in the Met Police, um, and, and he he was a really nice guy, and um, he taught me a lot, gave me a lot of advice. Um, and, and yeah, you know, so so we very much depended on each other, and we would. There was times when we went to Romania and Holland and and and, and the Czech Republic and places like that. But we went there for a reason. We went there because predators were telling me, "This is where I go. This is what I do," etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So again, it's about building up that credibility. 
because that's yeah. what you had to do. Did you ever break down at any moment, Ian? No, um, I didn't break down um, because I had a good support mechanism around me. Um, the flat, I'd be, I'd be telling a lie if the, you know, the flat job affected me in so much as because it was horrendous, it wasn't nice, um, and but again because I had that support mechanism around with me, I was able to sort of like talk it through. And then I did various presentations in the future, which again helped help me as an individual because I was able to sort of like promote what we did to try and get other people to come in and do what we did. But we could never get people to come in and do what we did because they just didn't want to do it. Why do you think a lot of people would reject? You can understand why, in fact, oh, uh, why yeah. a lot of people would reject that. Of course role. you could. And, and you, I think you've got to respect their wishes. You can't, you, you know... Um, People don't want to do it because they don't want to like be in the company of them because they don't like speaking to them. They've got children themselves, like I said before. They've got all these reasons why they don't want to do it. And you have to respect them for it. And I, I certainly wouldn't hold a grudge against anyone who doesn't want to do it. I'd rather have someone who wants to do it because they feel as though they can do it. Do you know what I mean? Rather than someone who's being forced to do it. Because, again, if you're forced to do something, it's not really in you and, and you could be caught caught out and stuff like that. Yeah, you'd want somebody to do it for the right reasons to try and make change. Oh, yeah. Do you think a lot of people could use that job, though, as predators themselves, as a get-out to see the things that you've seen to cover up their own tracks? Uh, well, I, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, when I, when I go back to what I, I think I said earlier about predators can come from all walks of life. There are predators within the police service. There has been. It's been well documented. Um, so so they are in that profession. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, God forbid there isn't anyone, well, certainly I, I don't know of anyone in the undercover world, but I'm, I'm out of it now and I've gone. But, um, but certainly within the police service, and certainly there's been officers that have investigated child abuse investigations and they've been predators. So do you know what I mean? It's... It is what yeah. it is, sadly. There's predators in every field. Every, every field. Do you know what I mean? They say, I've said this many times on the podcast before, but they say there's one in every fair that's got pedophile tendencies. So that's one in every street where yeah. the, your, your kids are basically an it's, it, 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 it's believable, isn't it? It, it is believable. Um, but but sadly, I think it, that's what it is. What we've got to try and do now, I think, and, and there's loads of organisers organizations out there certainly like bernardo's and nspcc they do a lot of sort of preventative work they do a lot of work sort of identifying children that may be at risk trying to get them off the streets um because you know that's where potentially they they can be at risk um and there's loads of organizations out there who are prepared to listen to children speak to children educate children um so yeah so yeah. Your book, Save a Child, was it 2016, 2017? When did that uh, get 2018. Released? It got published in November 2018. Um, and I got a lot of pleasure from it, mainly because there was a lot of education within it. So there was a lot of ad ad advice about, you know, just being mindful and awareness uh, for parents. Um, you know, because I do think there are two victims in all this. There's always a parent, potentially, and, and, a, and a child. Um I made a big decision to, to sort of like come out into the open world. Um, so when I first, when I retired from the police way back in, it seems ages now, 2011, um, I, I would give talks to foster agencies and organizations about sort of like being mindful of sort of the, the grooming issues and, and predators themselves. Uh, and then uh, Tazim Ahmed, who was a, a freelance journalist, who did a lot of work with Channel 4 dispatches, did a lot of work with, within the CSE element to it, very passionate about what she did. Um, we spoke and, and she wanted me to sort of do a particular piece where we were doing some awareness for parents. And uh, it was a big thing. And I, and I thought, well, this is massive because no one knew what I did. No one knew who I was. And now suddenly I was going to... Yeah, your book for every mum and dad is a book... You don't want to read but a book that they should read to get a bit more knowledge uh, and a bit of understanding of the red flags of the grooming of how people can man be manipulated that it's not a case of uh, predators going for kids they go for the parents um try and break them down to get an in with the kids what says it shows you the levels and the extremes that people go to yeah um, it, it, it's a it's a snapshot of certain work i did 
which just highlights the potential of the potential of risk. How do you feel now being at the forefront now with your face being out there? Do you worry about any risk or retaliation or do you feel strong enough to just go, yeah, with, go I, with it I, now? I, I feel comfortable with it. Uh, I mean, it's a massive decision, James. Do you know what I mean? Because you know what I mean? No one, knew, no one knows who you are and then suddenly you're going you're gonna to come out. And um, I never really had any negative press about it. Um, and rightly so, though. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you know... Um, at the end of the day, uh, I, I'm comfortable. Everything's been everything's been okay. Yeah. Going forward for the future, Ian, like, what's your plans? Uh, well, at the moment, I teach detectives on on training courses, which I enjoy. I really enjoy. Um, and um, you know, if any opportunities come up in the future, then yeah, it'd be great to sort of like do presentations and stuff like that. Yeah, I think like. I take my heart off to you for being so brave to do the job that you do. I know these subjects, a lot of people don't want to hear about that. A lot of people don't want to talk about it, but it's a subject that must be get spoke about because at the end, this could help potentially save kids that people could actually have alarm bells, alarm bells now where they can may recognise something that we didn't recognise before and have a better understanding of how dark these people kind of work. That to you, for you to do that job, listen, man, it's a brave job and you've you've helped save. Um, so many kids and help put a lot of predators in prison so I respect you for that brother but um, for people watching though what advice would you give for them or, or maybe they're, they're totally oblivious at who's come into their life or where their surroundings are what's it but any concrete telltale signs well I mean I would just I, I was just because um, it, it's all on an individual basis but if you want to be generalised um, just be mindful where you're going to meet someone how you meet them if it's an internet, if it's um, if it's a site, then you know just just be mindful what you're actually saying. And and the trigger is if they start making an interest in wanting to know whether you've got any children, then that's a flag. That's a red flag. Um, because if you have no children, then potentially they might not come back to you. But because you've got a child, then that's the hook. That's what they want to go. How do you sleep in that now, Ian? Fine, because it's gone. What, I, what I've done is gone. Just shut that off. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I think it's important to, for people to understand that for me to have had to do this work, I've had to have had to work very hard to deal with all sorts of stuff. Um, and, you know, it's not easy because I'm, ten, I'm telling a lie. Like, I'm not a predator. And yet I'm portraying myself as a predator. I've, uh, you know, I've got all sorts of hobbies and interests and I've got me profiles for me, me potential victims, but it's all a lie. And, and I've got to maintain that lie. So it's, so it's not easy trying to get into that world and it's a secret world. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed what I did. I, I saw them for what they really were. Um, I was pleased with the results that we got. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, it was good, um, and I was fortunate enough to get an award at the at the end of it, which you don't plan for awards, but at the end of the day, I got an award. So yeah, I was it was it was it was good, and it and it, it, and it was great for the family because it's recognition from the family really more than anything. Yeah, but I think you deserve more than an award for putting you through that misery. You'll probably hear and see things in your mind that you probably try and block out, but till the day you're on this earth, like yeah, the, the sad thing is somebody had to do that job. You're willing to put yourself at the forefront, even though probably thousands have been asked to do it and they've all declined. And you can understand why, also. And yeah, I, I think it's important to respect their wishes as well. Do you know what I mean? Because they will they will find their own niche, what 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 they feel as though they're good at, uh, and quite rightly so. Um, and and as I said, you know, and they would have to work hard at whatever they were going to do. Do you know what I mean? So mm. yeah. Because that stuff there could potentially turn into like a, a six-part series or a, a documentary just highlighting what you've went through and, and highlighting the telltale signs that could potentially help other people. Like, so for anybody watching, um, I'll maybe leave a link where you can get in contact with Ian. Um, I don't know if you want that, but for people maybe even speaking around schools and educating parents, like stuff like that, just to try and... Like, that information is valuable to them to help potentially save a fucking kid. Do you know yeah, what I, mean? like, I, I think... I think everyone should also just be mindful. You've got organisations out there, and I know I keep saying about Bernardo's and the NSPCC, um, 
but they've got loads of educational links out there. And I think people have just got to, do you know what I mean? Just take the time to look at these links. Um, and yeah, you know. Do you still do counselling just now, Ian? No. Nah, you just feeling, you feel better? I, you? no, no, uh, no. Um, as I said, you know, uh, that world is gone. That world, you know, that, that, that that's finished now. Um, I enjoy what I do. Um, you know, the, the, the book, I think it was a hard decision to, to do the book. Um, because again, it's a subject that perhaps people don't want to read. Um, and I didn't want to glorify what I did. I wanted to people to really understand just how difficult it is and how, how, how hard it is. Um, and I still think it's relevant now, even though we've, we're, we've moved into this online world. Um, there are predators out there. So, you know, it's not just about online. You've got to be careful online and, and look about all the, all the children now with, um, with technology and, and, and online, you know, the, 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 there's more likely likelihood now of children being abused now than ever before because it's so easy. Yeah. Um, well, it's on a global scale now. Yeah. Like Epst but no, um, Epstein and all that kind of stuff where you've got islands and fucking doing all sorts of dark stuff. Like it's, it's, um, no, I'm that world, that world is gone. Do you know what I mean? But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, it's good. Just before we finish up, brother, would you like to finish up on anything yourself or maybe it's anybody that's watching? Um, I mean, obviously, um, it goes without saying my wife, Julie, um, she's been phenomenal for me, um, and, and my family as well. Um, my children never really knew what I did, uh, and they didn't know until even when I went to Buckingham Palace and, and got the award, they didn't um they didn't really they, they couldn't understand why i was getting an award you know like what why why you know like is, you're a policeman you know why are you getting this award so they never really knew until much later when i i wanted to to come out and be a little bit more open uh, and then i told them about it and uh yeah so they were proud of me so um and and again really the he's not with us now but but the the person who put me into this world um i owe a lot to him because he you know he saw something that he thought i could do which i did uh, and hopefully i did it justice yeah but i would like to also um pay a particular thanks to perhaps people who um were working with me from an operational point of view who had the patience and mindset and and, and support mm -hmm. and also the psychologists yeah that's important to get it all out there and talk to somebody about that Last question. So, see, when you, you during the day you're a predator at night, you need to be a father. How how do you totally adapt? Does that become like a split personality, like a job to then switch off? Yeah, I mean, I used difficult? to try. Um, what I used to do was I used to try and come back at home at every opportunity, because by the time I came home, I was gradually coming down. So when I walked through the door, I was Ian. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and and like I'd left everything else mm -hmm. else behind me, um, and that's how I sort of dealt with it, really. Yeah. Because you, what you've got to do is you've got to say, right, I'm an actor, and I've done this role, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to park that where it is, and now I'm going home, and home is reality. Home is real. Being a predator is it's just false. It's just acting. So you have to have a rush home and just cuddle your kids and just tell them how much you loved them because you are concerned that it could potentially happen to them and they must have been thinking, why are you? You're always, I think you're always worried about your family. Um, you know, you become protected of your family, yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Ian, for coming on the day and telling your story, it's been a roller coaster. my head is pounding, if I'm honest, but it's uh, a story that needed to be told. Um, you're a true hero to many people. I know a lot of people might not understand the job that you took on, but people with kids will, will understand that you were there to protect kids, you were there to save kids, you were there to put the, the evilness of this world in prison, which you've done, and you got the award, you've got your book, and uh, hopefully many other doors open for you to try and educate people of actually what's going on. But fair play to Ian, and uh, I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you, James. Thanks very much.